Okay, so let's talk about those uh, lab reports. Last thing I want to talk about regarding the formal lab reports are the citations. And uh, so we already talked about citations way back in the lab one, lab two uh, report. There was that lab three pre-lab. Uh, so this is basically just a reminder of what you need to do for lab three. So I'm looking for a minimum of two citations. Uh, one citation should be your scientific paper. Um, for most people, it's gonna be the same paper that you picked out for the lab three pre-lab. If you wanna use a different paper, that's fine. It doesn't really matter as long as you do the method correctly. And the uh, citation should be in either your introduction or discussion section, or both, um, it doesn't matter. The second citation is gonna be your lab manual, and that's gonna be in the methods. And so uh, let's just talk a little bit about uh, that method that we talked about before uh, and how that's gonna be done. Uh, so a citation, uh, basically what a citation is, is a, a referral to a reference source within the body of your report or your essay or whatever it's going to be. So it doesn't give the full bibliographical information. And the method that we are going to use for Biology 107 is its own method. And you're basically going to put the author, comma, the year. And uh, there's a different way to do it depending on how many authors you have. If you have one author, it's just going to be author, comma, year. If you have two authors, you list both of their names, last names, and then followed by the, uh, by the date. If it's three authors, it's just going to be the first author followed by et al. Notice that et al has, uh, is in italics. It has a period at the end of al. Al is an abbreviation. So make sure you have all that punctuation correctly. Uh, sometimes people put it uh, in, the, in, the, in the middle of a sentence. Instead, if you're referring to the researchers, you can see this example here, a study by Smith et al. found that the beetroot membranes are blah, blah, blah. You go along with the sentence. So I, I'm not really looking at your paper. I'm not going to read your paper. I'm not going to confirm that it says everything you say about it. I'm mostly just looking that you can do a proper citation. So find something that's somewhat relevant, incorporate it into your lab uh, discussion somehow, and we're all good. Uh, so the second there's the lab manual, and um, you're going to put that in your method section. Usually it's the first sentence of your method section, and uh, you're going to have a sentence that's going to be something like, uh, the detailed procedure can be found in the uh, Biology 107 lab manual or something like that. Uh, and um, the citation is going to be author, comma, year. Now there is no author, um, so we'll just describe the college as the author, so Keanu College, and then the year. So I guess the year is 2022, so I need to update that, um, but hopefully you get the idea. And that's how I want you to do the citations, okay? Um, at the end of your report is going to be your literature cited or works cited section, or you might call it your references, uh, but we're going to call it works cited, and this means things that were directly cited. So you're going to list those items that you actually did cite. So for most of us, it's going to be the lab manual and that paper. Maybe you'll have one or two other things. Maybe you want to reference the textbook or, or another journal paper, and that's all perfectly fine. But I'm looking for those two, minimum two. Uh, the standard format for uh, journals is like this. So you can see you've got the last name, initials, comma, last name, initials, comma, and the last last name. You'll have the years. The title in sentence form, so notice we have uh, lowercase letters here. The journal name, the volume number, this is going to be in bold. And then the pages. So here's an example of an actual paper published in 2012 that I just found uh, on the journal database. So you can see that uh, there's punctuation around all the names of the individuals. Uh, you can see there's the year. Notice the year is not in brackets. Some people want to put the year in brackets at this stage. I don't know why they want to do that. Uh, you can see the name of the, uh, the article is in a sentence form. It has capitals at the beginning and capital only for the, uh, the species name. Uh, Canadian Journal of Microbiology, there is an abbreviation for that. You can use the abbreviations. If you use the abbreviations, remember to punctuate. So it'd be like this Canadian Journal. And, and the abbreviation for this one here is microbiol. And that's what the abbreviation would look like. You can see the volume and the page numbers are listed as well. Uh, the lab manual, you can uh, take a look at the end of the, uh, the lab 
um, manual uh, in Appendix A, I believe, uh, shows you how to do this. Again, you can see I didn't update the year. And this is actually referencing lab two. You want to make sure that you do reference lab three because that was the lab that we did the report for. And that's referenced a little bit more like a book and uh, so slightly different format. So make sure you do this properly. Every piece of punctuation is important. And if you don't, you're going to lose marks for that. It should be easy marks, but people are not paying attention to details. It's very important that you pay attention to details. So when you're finished your report, make sure you take a look at the marking guide that's found at the end of lab three. And you wanna go through and use this as a checklist. So you can see the introduction, you know, you've got a bunch of little things to make sure that you have in your introduction. Make sure all of those are there, go on to your methods and so on and so on. And uh, this is approximately what your lab report is gonna look like when you've done it. So it's gonna be double spaced, typed, uh, most people is going to be about five to six pages of the typed part. You're going to have three uh, graphs, so maybe another three pages. You're going to have um, your appendix, which is a photocopy of your results and your, your rough calculations. So that could be another two to three pages. So most people are going to have roughly around 10 to 12 pages of your report. Some of you might be a little longer winded or a little shorter winded and whatnot, but kind of in that range, 10 to 12 pages total is what you're looking for. You're also going to include your journal article as a separate document, just a PDF document. So there's uh, one more day to get this done. Uh, any last minute burning questions, please uh, contact me. You can always send me snippets or anything like that, and I can take a look at them. And uh, do make sure you get it in on time, as I'd love to, uh, love to have these graded in time as well to give you that feedback and to give you your, um, uh, your midterm grade, uh, overall grade for the course. Okay, so that's it for lab report tips. We are returning now to topic seven. And you may remember we have talked about these microtubules here. So these are microtubules, microtubules. They are made out of tubulin. And you remember some of the things that they're used for. So they're used for spindle fibers, uh, flagella and cilia. movement of organelles, and those are some of the really the main features of microtubules. Today we're going to talk about these actin filaments and these intermediate filaments, and uh, they all have their uses. So let's get into this and talk about what these things are. So actin filaments are also called microfilaments. These two names are used interchangeably microfilaments, actin filaments. These are not tubes anymore. These are filaments, so they're very skinny fibers. So think of that as a filament being a very skinny fiber, and hopefully that way you'll remember that these are the smallest of these cytoskeletal structures. You can also call them actin filaments because these things are made out of actin. So actin is the subunit protein. And so these proteins um, go together in sort of these rope-like strands, and you end up with two strands kind of uh, woven around each other. And to build them and to disassemble them, it, it costs ATP, which is why that's shown in the diagram there. So you may notice it says here that this is a web and network of proteins beneath the plasma membrane. So actin fibers are doing things that are near the plasma membrane. And you're going to see that when we talk about the different functions of the actin filaments. So one function of actin filaments is in making the shape of something called microvilli. So microvilli, uh, these are structures found in the cells of your small intestine. So you may or may not know about your digestive uh, capabilities and uh, your small intestine is where most of the nutrients in your body are digested. And uh, these microvilli, they give extra uh, surface area to these cells to allow for nutrient absorption. And that's basically what they're doing. So this is a semi-permanent structure, kind of looks like a bunch of little fingers or little hairs, and they're there for nutrient absorption. Um, you can see this actually includes microfilaments and intermediate filaments. 
The microtubules are down here more in the cytoplasm and uh, dealing with organelles. But uh, the, uh, the microfilaments are kind of a big part of the actual structure. So before I go any further, what I'm going to do is uh, return back to our um, notes that I was doing on the board here. And uh, so there's the notes for uh, the microtubules. So the microtubules are made out of tubulin. Microfilaments are made out of actin. So there it is, actin. And uh, actin are the subunits. So these ones here are the smallest, by the way. And uh, these are found, uh, I think we said, below the surface of the plasma membrane. Okay, and functions, there are many, and we will start off with those microvilli structure. Okay, so we will come back to this. Uh, and uh, like I said, this is just start of uh, kind of, you know, helping you to make your notes for organizing your thoughts around the uh, uh, cytoskeletal structures. So what else are these microfilaments doing? It turns out microfilaments, uh, you may have recognized the word actin because actin goes along with myosin. So actin and myosin, these are part of muscle fibers. So if you take a look down there at the bottom, there is a video here of muscle fibers. And if you, if you can see what's going on, they're kind of wiggling back and forth. And what's going on is they're contracting and relaxing, contracting and relaxing. So it turns out that uh, the myosin here, so the actin is, uh, just looking for room to write on this. So the actin is, is the cytoskeleton, is the actin, and the myosin, these are basically motor proteins. So remember last day we were talking about motor proteins. These are proteins that use ATP, sometimes GTP, they use energy and they move. And so that's exactly what's happening during muscle contraction. It's actually a really cool process. Uh, I'm not gonna go into a lot of details here, but I'll show you a couple of pictures. This is trying to show what's happening with this process. So the myosin is this stuff here in the middle. And uh, they basically, they move. They move along here, they move along the actin. So you can see down here in this bottom picture, what they've done is they've kind of crawled in this direction here. And so that's the contraction process. And when they relax, they kind of let go. They contract, they relax. And that's what we do with our muscles. We, we bend them and then we unbend them. And we're doing this all on a very small microscopic level. And this is actin, uh, is the structure that is a big part of that. The myosin is the other half, the picture on this. What else is actin doing? Uh, we had um, looked at amoeba, and amoeba uh, move around by amoeboid motion. Here's a, a little cartoon showing one, and you can see the, that right here, this stuff here uh, called the plasma gel is loaded with actin. And that actin can form the fibers and unform the fibers and basically push these projections here. And these projections are called pseudopods. Pseudopods, if you remember, we talked about these already. Pseudo means fake or false and pod means feet. And this is how um, amoebas move. I know I have a video here. Uh, this is actually a video that I took in the lab. And you can see that amoeba is uh, trying to crawl along and move uh, throughout its environment by, uh, by basically changing the shape of its, um, of its cytoplasm. So pretty cool. There's an image there on the left from the uh, textbook. I don't know why they colored it um, bluish purplish or bluish turquoise kind of color, uh, but you can see some of the, um, the features on it. This here is probably the nucleus is my guess. And they, they're, they're showing that the cytoplasm is loaded with uh, all sorts of uh, actin subunits. All right, back to here, we can add a couple of features. So what did we just have there? We had a muscle contraction, uh, amoeboid movement. That's how you spell amoeboid. And we'll come back to this. We're not done with actin. It's very versatile. There's all sorts of things it can do. So here's something else that's kind of weird. And um, I think uh, somebody observed this in the class. I can't remember who it was. They said, hey, I think the chloroplasts are moving. And uh, this is actually something that uh, actin can do. It can move chloroplasts around. And this, this whole thing 
the whole idea behind this thing called cytoplasmic streaming is basically um, to move water around a cell. Some plant cells are actually quite large and uh, diffusion is too slow. So the cell is trying to speed this whole thing up. And one more thing that's more applicable to animal cells is the formation of something called a cleavage furrow. So cytokinesis is what happens after mitosis. So you may remember mitosis, we have uh, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. After all the DNA is done going through its separation procedures, uh, the cytoplasm needs to be separated. And so the cytoplasm in an animal cell is, is separated by uh, basically pinching the two cells away. And this pinching process is called the formation of, of a cleavage furrow. And, and that is, uh, is all done by actin. Actin is pulling at the membrane. All right, let's add those on there. And uh, what did we have? Uh, cytoplasmic streaming, cytoplasmic streaming. We'll put maybe the note, plant cells, uh, cleavage, furrow, animal cells. So like I said, actin is very versatile. You can see a lot of these features are very cell specific. We got microvilli, we've got amoebo, cytoplasmic streaming, cleavage, furrow. Different cell types are making use of actin in different ways. But it's all usually has something to do with structures around uh, and near the cellular membrane. Okay, so the last one are intermediate filaments. So let's take a look at intermediate filaments. If you haven't noticed, uh, they are intermediate, which means medium in size. So the microtubules are large, they are 25 nanometers. The actin filaments are seven nanometers, and these are somewhere in the middle at eight to 12 nanometers. So they are truly intermediate. Hopefully that helps you to remember that they are in the middle of the range just by that word. So these things are, um, what are they made of? Um, they're made of various types of subunits and the subunits are, uh, are usually from the uh, keratin family. So maybe I can write that down, we'll call this uh, keratin family subunits. So keratin is found in your skin, by the way, but it's, it's found really all over your body. And uh, it's found often in these intermediate filaments, which are, basically just structural proteins holding the shape of all sorts of cells. These things tend to be a little bit more permanent. And uh, we've already actually seen one type of intermediate filament. Uh, and it is this from this slide right here. So this is the intermediate filament we talked about actually uh, a couple of units ago are the nuclear lamina. So the nuclear lamina are basically found kind of just on the inside of the, uh, plas or the, not the plasma membrane. This is the nuclear membrane. And they're holding that nuclear membrane in place. They're making, giving it its shape. Um, and like I said, they're a little bit more permanent structures. They tend not to be moving things around. They tend to be a little bit more static. Now we've already looked at one other example. We saw this example here of intermediate filaments that are involved in the microvilli. So they're not as close uh, as the microfilaments. The microfilaments are kind of found right on the membrane. These are basically anchoring them just below the membrane and part of that, uh, part of that structure anyway. Uh, there's all sorts of examples. If you go back to this slide here, it's talking about uh, axons and neurons. And there's all sorts of weird cells all over your body. And many of them have uh, individual and, and unique types of, um, of intermediate filaments. And uh, I'm not gonna go into tons of examples. It's sufficient for this class to know those two examples. So let, let's fill this in, okay, uh, for intermediate filaments. So we've already said what the subunit is. So keratin family proteins, okay. Um, what's the size? These are medium. There's no medium ist, just medium, I guess. Cellular location, we'll say various uh, because it depends on their function, but they, uh, the two that we talked about are the nuclear lamina. And of course, of course those are found uh, uh, giving shape to the nuclear membrane and uh, the microvilli structure. And those are of course, um, uh, not quite under the membrane, but they're actually underneath the actin filaments giving that, uh, giving that structure some shape. 
And that's kind of it. You could fill in more details on this, but uh, I'm not expecting you to know a ton about these, uh, these uh, cytoskeletal features considering it's basically one lecture. What I'm looking at is that you know a little bit about each of them and, uh, and examples are always good to know for this. Okay, so a couple more things to say about um, the cytoskeleton. There's our microvilli again and our nuclear lamina. Uh, the last thing to say about the cytoskeleton is uh, a lot of textbooks still say this is for eukaryotes only, but it turns out that cytoskeletons are found in bacteria. Uh, and here's an example of one. You can see this is, a, uh, it's kind of a spiral shape. So if you look at that carefully, you can see in the diagram, it kind of in the, uh, in the image, it looks something like this. And so what that cytoskeletal unit is doing is giving that cell basically a rod shape. You can see the cell is a rod shape. If I were to take that cytoskeleton out, we'd end up with a spherical shaped cell. Uh, this doesn't have the name actin. It has a funny name, MREB, but it's basically a type of actin is what that particular uh, protein is. Uh, turns out that cytoskeletal uh, proteins have been found in all sorts of bacteria out there, and they have kind of some of the similar functions, giving cell shape, involved in cell division, and a variety of other, other functions that we're still trying to sort out. But they are out there. Just for some reason, it's not in our textbook yet, and uh, maybe the next edition. Okay, so that's it for cytoskeletons. Uh, just a short unit. And uh, we're going to transition now to topic eight. So let me just load that up here. Give me a second. I'll load that up. And we have the, um, basically three short units in a row that are going to take us through the week. And, uh, and then we'll get into some more meaty stuff after the break. After the break, we're going to talk about uh, respiration and photosynthesis. So these next couple of units are kind of just getting us ready for respiration and photosynthesis. Topic eight, we wanna talk about energy and energetics and cellular order. Topic nine, we're gonna talk about enzymes. And like I said, those things are gonna help us to get ready to talk about respiration, which will be done after the reading week. So let's get into topic eight. Topic eight is all about energy and Right to start off topic eight, I actually have a video I want to show you. And uh, I'm gonna play this for you and I'll make a couple of comments as the video plays. And uh, um, well, let's just play it and I'll show you. It's very, very cool. It was done by um, a group that worked with uh, Harvard University. So they had a pretty big budget and what they wanted to do was to, to make an animation that was as accurate as possible to what current biology is telling us. So let me play that right now. It's called the inner life of a cell. What we're seeing actually are some white blood cells moving around by amoeboid movement. So now they're zo zooming in on the membrane. You can see this phospholipids wiggling around and uh, integral membrane proteins. Uh, there's some, uh, I think that's some actin right there, just below the membrane. Now we're going into the cell and those are actin fibers and uh, intermediate filaments actually uh, co-connected with one another. So there's uh, some actin forming some strands. Some sort of enzyme cleaving it. And there is some tubulin. Remember tubulin forms microtubules, which are tubes. And uh, they're showing you that it's very dynamic. It uh, forms and unforms. So there's a vesicle and a motor protein moving the, uh, the vesicle along the microtubules. Uh, so there's the centriole. The microtubules are coming out of there. There's spindle fibers. And uh, what we're looking at here are nuclear pores. And that is actually a messenger RNA coming out of the nuclear pore and it's gonna go find a ribosome. That's what is actually happening right now. I think they're gonna zoom in on it. There's the ribosome. 
and the ribosome is making a little protein. Not sure what that is. I think that's supposed to be the mitochondria. And uh, yeah, so you can see this little protein is being made. It's being made right directly into the endoplasmic reticulum. So that was a, a that's a rough endoplasmic reticulum making the membrane. There goes our vesicle again. Protein is probably in there, and it looks like the vesicle is traveling all the way to the Golgi body. And eventually, it looks like these proteins are getting secreted from the cell into the, uh, the cell environment. And there goes our little white blood cell. I'm not sure who it's looking for, probably looking for a bacterial organism to destroy, but it's moving around by me. So if you look on the internet, you can find a pretty good explanation of this, but I want to show this to you because it's so easy to think about cells as static. You know, we see our, our textbook pictures and nothing is moving around. And I really like this video because you can see how dynamic everything is. Everything is constant motion. And the other prong of this is all this motion and movement and, and activity requires energy. And it's a good segue into talking about energy today for, uh, for this class. So I just need to figure out how to exit this YouTube here. Uh oh, I think I just unshared my screen. Let me just reshare my screen. So we need to talk about energy and metabolism. And uh, so we have a lot of kind of definitions to really cover in today's topic. We probably won't get through all of it today, but that's fine. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll touch on it when we talk about enzymes on Friday. Um, so first of all, what is metabolism? Okay, so metabolism um, is a word that's used very loosely. People talking about wanting to boost their metabolism to lose weight and things like that. But really metabolism just means these are the reactions that are happening in your cell or body, okay? And there are different ways to think about metabolism. Uh, here's kind of a, a map that shows you we can think about catabolic metabolism or catabolic reactions over here. We can also think about anabolic reactions over here. So take a look at the, uh, the relationship between these things. Oops, there we go, right back at it. Um, so catabolic reactions, right? They basically break things down so they break things down and turn them into simple molecules. So we could get uh, things like glucose, cholesterol, fatty acids, amino acids, and things like that. Generally, when we break them down, we produce ATP. And uh, often these simple molecules are, are taken by anabolic reactions, you can see over here, and we might form more complex molecules. So maybe we're gonna start forming uh, glycogen or phospholipids or proteins. And that, of course, consumes ATP and regenerates ADP. So this is kind of a, a summary of the things we're going to talk about in today's lecture, really. So if you didn't get all that, don't worry, we're going to kind of pick it apart piece by piece. First of all, let's go back to these definitions, okay? Catabolic, breaking things down, releasing energy. So the example here is, for example, breaking down glucose, okay? So glucose is uh, six carbons, and uh, it gets broken down by respiration into carbon dioxide. Now notice this is not a balanced equation. If you want a balanced equation, we can do that. I'm not too concerned about balanced equations in biology 107. But notice you're going from a six carbon compound to one carbon compound. So that is breaking it down and you're releasing energy. So anabolic is quite clearly the opposite of that. Uh, this is where we are taking energy, taking simple molecules. So in this example, you can see amino acids are our simple molecules, taking some energy, and we're building something more complex. So a, a protein is a bunch of amino acids strung together. So these two things are basically the opposite of each other. Catabolic breaking things down, anabolic building things up. You can always remember anabolic steroids. That's what people use to build muscle. Anabolic is building. Catabolic is breaking things down. Just like cats. Cats like to scratch things and, and uh, wreck coaches. They're breaking them down, right? Okay, those are our first definitions. We'll come back to those in a bit. Uh, next, we wanna talk a little bit about energy and define some things around energy. We're thinking about energy all the time, of course, in Fort McMurray, because we're uh, 
we're harvesting it from the uh, oil sands. But uh, what we want to talk about is energy in biology. And usually we're talking about potential energy in biology, which means energy stored in chemical bonds. So you probably know a little bit about chemistry and, and how you're putting molecules together and, and you're forming bonds. And so when you form and break bonds, energy is exchanged. And sometimes energy is stored in those bonds. And that's what we're going to talk about when we talk about potential energy. Here's another way to think about potential energy. Uh, you can see the, uh, that uh, Katniss there, she's pulled back on her bow and she's holding it, right? She's holding that energy there and it takes strength to hold it. And that energy, all she has to do is release her fingers and the arrow will fly. And that's what potential energy in chemical bonds is like. It's energy just ready to be released. And sometimes it needs a catalyst or something else to, to get it going. Uh, but it is energy that's available and ready to be released. Here's another, um, another diagram kind of showing you uh, some different types of energy. Um, so for example, you've got this person who's on top of the diving board and he or she has potential energy. All he has to do is just jump off the end and it's gonna release that energy. The person in the water has less energy because they haven't climbed the ladder yet. And um, energy gets trans transferred into different types. So climbing the ladder or diving converts that potential energy into kinetic energy and so on. You can talk about light energy and heat energy and things like that, but often in biology, when we talk about energy, usually we mean energy stored in chemical bonds, which is potential energy. So there's one, uh, one definition for you. Um, and another thing we have to think about, so I'm sorry, this whole unit is really about defining things and, and um, quickly going over some concepts that I'm hoping you're somewhat familiar with. Um, another thing to think about energy is that energy uh, obeys what is called the laws of thermodynamics. And I'll make some notes for you on thermodynamics in a moment here. But uh, let's take a look at the laws of thermodynamics. Um, the first law of thermodynamics is that energy is not created or destroyed. Um, this is called the conservation of energy and mass in the universe. So energy we have in the universe is here to stay. And it doesn't disappear. It doesn't appear magically. Um, but it can get converted between different forms. So if you take a look at this, here's a bear. The bear is eating a fish. And so the fish has chemical energy stored in its bonds and the bear is gonna use that to do whatever it does, walk around or swim or whatnot. And so I'll, I'll write you maybe a clearer definition of the first law here in a moment. Um, I wanna just talk about the second law of thermodynamics. So let me play this video for you while I talk. So this video here is a time-lapse video of some strawberries that were sat out on a dish and uh, they kept a camera on the strawberry for a few days. And you can see that uh, basically they're starting to break down. They're starting to um, spoil. And if you watch carefully, you can see them kind of droop and, and liquefy. Uh, so what is this all about? The second law of thermodynamics says that energy transformations result in entropy. That means that entropy uh, is, is where things tend towards. So what does that mean? It means that things get more disordered, that there's a cost to living is what it means. And everyone is probably familiar with entropy. Um, think about your, your bedroom or your kitchen. It doesn't take much before things get messy and suddenly the dishes are all over the place or you have socks on the floor or whatever. And, uh, and you know that in order to tidy up your bedroom or tidy up your kitchen, it takes energy. So, so this is kind of what entropy is all about. So let me, like I said, write a couple of uh, kind of uh, uh, better ways to approach this. And what I call this is, uh, is uh, um, laws of thermodynamics for cells. So you can see that the second law has a lot to do with, uh, with organization. And that's one of the, uh, the characteristics of life, right? Is that living things are organized. So let me write these laws and I'll come back to those slides here in a second. So think about these laws. The first law of thermodynamics was that energy is not created or destroyed, okay? So we're gonna call this the laws of thermodynamics for cells, okay? So the first law of thermodynamics is this, is that cells cannot create 
or destroy energy. But they can convert it between different types. So what do we mean by that? It means we can take chemical energy from a fish and we can convert it and make it into kinetic energy for us to move around. We can take that energy from fish and we can make it into new bonds to form new molecules in our bonds. So that's what cells can do. They're very good at converting energy. They're very good at metabolism. So the second law is that cells are organized structures. And it takes energy to maintain order Or you can think about it this way, it takes energy to stay alive. And that really is a good way of thinking about the uh, second law of therm thermodynamics. Cells are trying to build organized complex structures, it takes energy to do so. Uh, you could add a clause on that and say that energy is at the cost of our food or our surroundings. And that's what some of those previous slides are about. Um, maybe I'll show them to you now. You can see this one here. It's showing there's our little cell and it's uh, getting organized and the food it's consuming gets deorganized, meaning it gets broken down and becomes simpler uh, compounds. Um, there's the bears again. You can see they're showing that second uh, image of the bear. You can see the bear is exhaling carbon dioxide and water, so disorganized, simple compounds at the expense of the bear basically being alive. So there's my two laws of thermodynamics. And like I said, this is how I want you to think about them, okay? Uh, if you take chemistry 102, you're probably gonna talk about these things in a lot more detail, the laws of thermodynamics. Uh, but it's important to kind of think about the practical real world uh, aspects of these type of things. Okay, so one more uh, definition for you. And the last definition for you is uh, something called free energy. So free energy is often represented by this here, this delta G, okay? And G actually stands for a scientist. His name was Gibbs, and he was a guy who studied this. So that's why free energy is associated with the G. Delta means a change. So free energy is a type of energy, and you can think of it as the ability to do work. So it's useful energy. Because some energy, if we go back to the bear here, Notice that some energy here is lost as heat and disorder to the surroundings. So unfortunately, that is, uh, is not usable energy. The bear can't, can't make use of that. Um, so this is what free energy is. And there's kind of a way to break this down. And uh, at the, I'm showing you some formulas. I will not ask you to do any math around these formulas. If you take chemistry 102 or other courses, you'll probably see these formulas in a lot of ways. But it's worth it to kind of take a look at this. You take a look at the uh, formula on the bottom. Um, delta G is the total energy, and then we're minusing that heat and disorder. So this is a way for um, chemists and biochemists to kind of keep track of how much usable energy is in a compound, because technically a compound has a lot of, you know, it has more energy in it that is useful. Some of it, like I said, it's escaping uh, as heat. The delta basically means we're looking at the uh, final state minus the starting state. So I'll show you some examples. Going back to the, uh, the diver, right? So you can see the diver here is up at the top of the platform and he dives off. So he starts off with more energy and in the second state, he's losing energy. Okay, so going from one state to another and the amount of energy can actually be calculated. Uh, and that's what we do often in the realm of chemistry. You can see the second example, we have diffusion. So we have some, some molecules in a solution and they get separated. So they go from an organized state to a less organized state. And so they're losing some of their energy. Uh, the last example is a chemical reaction. So it looks like we have some glucose here. And at the bottom, we have carbon dioxide and we have water. 
And so the carbon dioxide and water are simpler, less complex compounds. So we're going from a high energy state to a low energy state. So let's talk about what, the, what these numbers mean here. Um, hold on, what's going on with my slide? Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Um, what these numbers mean, because we're gonna see some of these numbers and we're gonna see them when we're talking about respiration. And uh, this, is, this is a way, like I said, to describe the amount of energy and, and, uh, that a, a chemical reaction either releases or the amount of energy a chemical reaction uh, requires to proceed. So generally, a delta G, negative delta G, means that a compound is, um, is releasing energy. And it means it's spontaneous, which means it can proceed without, uh, without needing any extra energy. So this is kind of the, um, the bottom line right here. And uh, hold on a second. So it says energy is lost from living systems is entropy and heat. Only processes with negative delta G are spontaneous. Spontaneous process can be harnessed to perform work. Okay, so just looking for a little space here. Here's kind of the bottom line. So if your delta G value is negative, so if it's a negative number, so example, let's say it equals to negative 2,500 uh, kilojoules. Okay, then the reaction, then the reaction can proceed without energy. without needing energy. Okay, um, the opposite is, what if the delta G is positive? So for example, what if it's positive 2,500 kilojoules? So therefore, in this case, it needs energy to proceed. And that's all I want you to know. Um, somebody's probably thinking, well, what if it's zero? Zero is not negative or positive. And um, it doesn't matter. Zero never happens in a cell. Zero is equilibrium. Equilibrium is not something that happens uh, in nature very often. Um, it's not something we're concerned about in living cells. Anyway, uh, again, something you'll cover in, in uh, Chemistry 102 if you take that course. So let's take a look at, at two examples, going back to this slide here. So you may notice a couple of things are slightly different. Before I called this one catabolic, and I called this one here anabolic. Okay, so now I'm using a different term, and exergonic. So this is something, exer means out, gonic means energy. So this means it releases energy. And ender means in, and gonic is energy, meaning energy is brought in the system. So here's the example. Um, I showed you this formula before. Uh, this is the breakdown of glucose. And remember, this releases energy. And there's my delta G. So my delta G is a negative value, meaning that energy is released as the reaction proceeds. Um, you can think about photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a process where carbon dioxide is, uh, and water are converted into carbohydrates, and this requires energy. So here's my energy that's required. And you can see that for photosynthesis, it is a positive value. So that is kind of what I want you to know for, um, for this energy stuff here. Um, there's a little bit more that I want to talk about uh, for this unit, and uh, I'm just going to do a time check in a second. But um, here's, here's the bottom line, right? I told you I'd come back to this. Catabolic pathways are exergonic. They release, uh, they release energy, and the delta G is negative. Um, and complexity is reduced. Exergonic reactions, the delta G is positive. And complexity is increased. Okay, so lots of, um, like I said, kind of um, words around this to help us, uh, help us really understand respiration and photosynthesis is really the whole goal of these, of these slides. So I wanna just show you there's, um, the textbook is full of a bunch of diagrams kind of like this. And it's, it's worth it to take a little bit of a look at them. 
And we're going to come back to them when we talk about uh, enzymes. Um, and this is kind of, a, we call this a re reaction um, progress graph, I guess you call it. And you can see over on the, uh, on the y-axis is energy, free energy, in fact. And if you take a look at the reactants, the energy starts at a high level and the energy uh, drops down to a lower level. So it's kind of like the diver jumping off of the diving board. And so energy is released. So it makes sense that this is a negative number. Uh, on the exergonic reactions, you can see the uh, reactants are low energy. We pump some energy into it. It goes up and our delta G is positive. Okay, so just a different way to think about it in terms of uh, the graphs. I know some people respond to graphs well, other people don't like graphs, but um, just wanted to show you this in, an, in another light. Okay, so here is a test yourself question. It says here, uh, delta G positive, a uh, delta G value is positive 2,700 kilojoules per mole. So what does this mean? Okay, so we better pick apart this uh, multiple choice piece by piece here. So remember that delta G with a positive, this is an anabolic reaction. Remember that, okay? Which means we're gonna build something up. So exothermic, no. Remember exothermic, it means we're releasing energy. In this case here, we're absorbing energy. So that one is incorrect. The action will re reaction will require an enzyme. We're not really given that information. Most reactions require enzymes and cells, but uh, I don't think that's, that's relevant. The reaction will be spontaneous. Um, no, this reaction requires energy. So that is not the correct answer either. The reaction requires energy to proceed. Yes, by definition, that's what a positive delta G means. The reaction released 27 kilojoules per mole, that's no. That's the opposite of, of requiring energy to proceed. So D is the correct uh, answer there on that. Okay, just doing a time check here. Um, I have a little bit more to talk about, uh, mostly around, I think, ATP and, and, uh, and a few other concepts. Let me just uh, take a peek ahead here for a second. I'm just wondering, um, yeah, I think, um, okay, actually, I've got two more slides I want to I cover, and then we'll, we'll wrap it up for today. So this is kind of showing you um, all these concepts, again, in a, in a very uh, a small, sort of concise manner, right? What are our cells doing with energy? Well, we're consuming things. We're consuming nutrients, we're consuming energy. We're spitting out waste products and heat and the cell is becoming organized, organized. Let's take a, a look at a, kind of a more complex way to look at this. So here's our cell and uh, let's, let's just think about what we're actually consuming. Okay, as humans, most of our energy is coming from these three nutrients, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Um, if you're a plant cell, you might use light energy. If you're a weird bacterium, you might use some sort of mineral. Bottom line is energy is going into the cell. And usually what happens is these things are broken down and we make ATP. So ATP we will be talking about next day. Some of the energy is stored in other macromolecules. So more uh, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and of course, nucleic acids. And uh, we're losing energy. Um, some energy is lost in our waste products found in chemical bonds, and some energy is lost in the environment. Okay, so that was a whirlwind of definitions and things like that. And like I said, we're going to get a chance to apply these concepts with respiration. And uh, on Friday, we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit more about ATP. And, uh, and then we're going to talk about enzymes as well. But other than that, it looks like we're at the end for today. So I'll finish there. and. Um, I guess I'll see everybody tomorrow in the lab. We're going to be doing lab, um, lab which lab are we on? Lab six tomorrow. So I'll see you uh, tomorrow in the lab.